Okay, you feel a little bit overtired? Let's look at states of consciousness. We're going to look at the continuum of consciousness from wakefulness to being fast asleep. We're going to look at the stages of what is a normal sleep. We're also going to look at some altered states of consciousness. Altered states of consciousness are things like hypnosis and the use of psychoactive drugs. Okay, we'll look at, you know, what are the effects of drugs? How do they, you know, the different families, the classifications. We'll also look at hypnosis as far as what are the theories behind it? What does it do? And what are the dangers and what, what are the myths? Okay, so we're looking at states of consciousness, unit five coming up right away. Here we go. All right, let's start with the definition of, of consciousness. What we say is it's basically an awareness of yourself and your environment. And once again, we're going to look at sleep, wake, and altered states. We're going to begin by looking at an altered state, which is hypnosis. Here are the learning objectives, so you know what we're looking for. So when we look at states of consciousness, you know, some occur spontaneously, daydreaming, drowsiness, and dreaming. And when we look at our continuum of consciousness, and it is a continuum, things like daydreaming are actually important parts of it. They are almost as important as sleep or anything else. We all do daydream, some of you more than others, apparently, but daydreaming is actually a natural function. Um, some are psychologically induced. Hallucinations, orgasm, food or oxygen starvation would be physi or sorry, physiologically induced. Okay, so these are, are states that um, your physiology has everything to do with. And some are psychologically induced, like sensory deprivation, hypnosis, and meditation. And hypnosis is what we're focusing on first. So hypnosis, okay, is a is a some would say it's an altered state, but is it an altered state? And we'll look into it. Um, hypnotic induction is how we, the whoever's hypnotizing you or however you're getting hypnotized is how that occurs, it, how it is induced. Okay. Some facts and falseheads to start off with. Okay. It's everybody that's involved in it agree that the power resides in the subject's openness to suggestion. Okay, so there's some certain characteristics, and we'll look kind of closely at them in class. Um, but basically, there are some people that are more easily hypnotized. Everybody can be hypnotized to an extent, uh, but some easier than others. And that's our first question that we look in facts and falsehood. Can anyone experience hypnosis? To some extent. And there are some tests that uh, we can see to see how susceptible you are to hypnosis, how suggestible you are. Um, we'll, we'll try some of them in class to see how suggestible you are. One is a postural sway test, um, which basically is a suggestion that somebody is going to be swaying. In, uh, uh, we'll show you that. We'll demonstrate that. And we'll also demonstrate a couple of other tests that are used. Um, susceptibility just means how easy is it for you to be hypnotized. Can it enhance recall of forgotten events? A lot of people think, you know, that we can just go in and hypnotize somebody and you'll pull a memory out of your thing, but if you, out of your brain, but if you remember memory, brains aren't all stored in one place, so the answer is no. Um, this is a myth that's out there that, that we think we're going to. What we find is a lot of memories when we pull out of somebody from hypnosis is a, a real combination of fact and fiction. Uh, people are very suggestible. If you remember false memories, a lot of them occur under hypnosis. Can it force people to act against their will? Can they take you into their room and force you to strip naked and run down the street? Or force you to kill your best friend that they're trying to do off with? The answer to that one is no. You will not do anything morally that you would not do under hip, if you weren't under hypnosis. And there's lots of research to back that up. Can it be therapeutic? Well, in this case, the answer is yes. It can be therapeutic, and there are lots of uses that hypnosis has been used to um, to help people heal. Um, injuries will cure, cure faster under surgery. Uh, it seems to work, but on the other hand, the self-suggestion can make you heal faster too. Can it alleviate pain? And here again, the answer is yes. Um, there's been surgeries conducted with people under hypnosis, and it blocks the pain. And again, it probably has to do with activating those pain gates when you're under hypnosis. And the actual brain structures we look at somebody under hypnosis actually change as well. 
or not the structures, but which ones are being used. But the Lamaze method of birth control can help control pain too, and it's a diversion. So there is some controversy, but hypnosis definitely does seem to have its place. Good hypnotic subjects. Are people acting like good hypnotic subjects when they're under it? Maybe some of you have seen a hypnotist perform. Um, and if you've done that, a whole large group of people come up, they do some suggestibility tests, the other people sit down, and then they go about doing their little hypnotic show as an entertainer. Um, it could be because of social influence. Now, because you're supposed to be hypnotized, you're going to be a good subject, you're going to act like you're hypnotized. And it's not that someone's pretending, it's that they take on this role. And the social influence, they get so caught up in that role that it happens. In this little experiment we're showing right here, um, they put the patient or the person's arm in ice water that they, they couldn't stand. They see how long they can keep it in there. Then they would hypnotize them. And what they found is, you know, that in this case, perhaps the subject is so caught up in the hypnotized role that they actually ignore that pain. The other one includes disassociation. Disassociation is like a, a, a split mind of sort. Okay. So it's like, when we put these people with their arms in the ice water and we give them another way to indicate how painful it is in there, they indicate that they're feeling pain, yet it doesn't seem to bother them with their arm there. So is it like your brain kind of splits off into two sets of consciousness at this point? And it is important to understand when we're talking about consciousness in a modern sense. It's not like Freud's idea of consciousness where it's childhood memories that you're carrying around beneath. It's more of the, the idea of parallel processing where we process all this information out of the awareness of our consciousness. So sleep patterns and sleep theories. First of all, we're bio, biological beings are, are have, have rhythms, okay? Um, we have rhythms with the moon. We have rhythms with night and day. We have rhythms, uh, menstrual cycles, and so on. Uh, a circadian rhythm is that 24 hour, hour cycle that you go on. This is the one that can be affected by jet lag. You travel somewhere and it's a four hour different time and you have trouble adjusting to the actual sleep times, so it's difficult. Um, Temperature changes can have an effect on it. The circadian rhythm, uh, when it's time to get drowsy, your body temperature actually drops. And it's an unconscious thing that happens. Your body temperature drops, you get drowsy, you go to bed, and you go to sleep. Okay, um, Circadian rhythms and age seem to change somewhat. And you know, just naturally, some of us are morning larks and some of us are night owls. Where do you perform best? Are you best in the mornings or are you best in the evenings? So sleep basically contains cycles of different kind of brain waves that affect you. And the, the cycles last approximately 90 minutes. Okay, and we have REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement, and we have non-REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep is the period of time where your, your brain waves are actually quite active, just like you're awake. Non-REM sleep is basically your brain waves are slowing down, and we spend most of our night in, in non-REM sleep. So when we measure this sleep activity, uh, if you go to a sleep clinic or someone's going to measure it, they're going to hook you up to some equipment that look at your eye movements, your muscle tension, your electroencephalogram patterns, which are your brain waves. And they're looking for certain patterns, beta waves, alpha waves, and delta waves. Okay, and the beta waves are ones when you're awake, alpha waves is when you're just getting drowsy, just drifting off, and delta waves are in deep sleep. And we'll look a little more closely at them in a minute. But this is the apparatus and, and the type of brain waves that you might see, or the type of reports these instruments might show you. So they're looking at eye movements, they're looking at muscle tension, and they're looking at the brain waves, the shape of the wave. So let's begin by looking at non-REM sleep. So we start in, in stage one when we're actually in sleep. But if we look at this chart here, these are beta waves. So remember, beta waves are the brain. Your brain is awake and alert. Okay, and then when you start to get drowsy, you go into alpha. Or we might call it um, alpha sleep, where we get these bigger brain waves that happen. Okay, so non-REM one sleep, you can see the difference in the shapes of the wave and we'll identify these in a moment. But some characteristics of stage one sleep in non-REM, 
uh, hallucinations are not uncommon. This is when you get a sensation of falling or some kind of sensory input where there is none. Um, and we call this a hypnagogic sensation. It's like a dream, but there's no story to it. It's just like an hallucination that you have. And you can capture this. Uh, it's usually right as you fall, drift off into sleep. Then you pass into the second stage of sleep, which we look at the brain waves here. They're very similar. These are theta waves, by the way. And these are theta waves, but they're also marked by sleep spindles, these spiky waves. And that's the big marker of stage two sleep. Now in stage one and two, you you can be awoken quite easily. You're not in a deep sleep. Um, so, so, you know, a door closes somewhere, it may be enough to wake you up. But however, after we pass through this second stage of non-REM, we go into our third stage, which is deep sleep. And these are delta waves. They're large amplitude waves. This is a time when... Um, Things like sleepwalking might happen, sleep talking is really common, uh, mostly at stage three. And in deep sleep, you're, it's difficult to wake you up. This is like when your alarm goes off, you don't hear it, you're probably in deep sleep. And again, here they are. We got the waking beta, the alpha. This is our non REM sleep. So these are theta waves, theta waves with splint spindles, and our delta waves. But REM sleep, is this period right here. And you'll notice the wave looks very much like beta waves. And what's happening is your brain is quite active. And what we've been able to associate is dreams with REM sleep. If you wake someone up during REM sleep, which you can actually observe from the just physically looking at someone. And oddly enough, it's the last stage that we discovered. It's the only one that you can actually tell physically what's happening. Um, they're often going to repeat a dream. We we will call this, we call this paradoxical sleep. Um, things are still happening, but your body goes into paralysis. Um, other than maybe, you know, it's a slight finger twitch or something like that. Um, also, there's um, genital stimulation before you wake up during REM sleep is often because you had a dream. And during your REM sleep and the um, sexual organs are stimulated where males get erections and females um, get vaginal wetness happening. And this is why we call it paradoxical sleep, because it's like you're awake, however, you're sound asleep. But the brain activity is very much the same. Now, REM rebound, it's like your body, we need REM sleep. It's like your body keeps track for like, we think probably up to like two weeks of when you don't get enough sleep, you're missing out on that REM. So then your body will compensate when you go to sleep after you've been deprived of REM sleep, you'll get into REM sleep uh, more quickly. And you'll also have more periods of it, longer lasting periods. And the idea is it's trying to, it seems like it's trying to catch up on the REM sleep that you've lost. This is the typical night's sleep for people your age right here. So you go from awake, you drop down into stage one to stage two to stage three. You go back up from three to two to one, and then you enter a period of REM sleep. You disappeared. You enter a period of REM sleep, and then you go back down, back into deep sleep. And notice the, the REM sleep gets a little bit longer. You may experience a period of, of wait, being awake. You probably won't remember it. There's a three to five minute window uh, right before you fall asleep. You probably won't encode any information, so you won't remember those things, that period of wakefulness. Then we go back into deep sleep. Notice our REM sleep gets longer. We don't go into quite as deep a sleep. We might go into wakefulness without going into REM. But the REM increases as we go. And ideally, what you want to happen if your sleep is timed properly, you're going to go through REM sleep, you have a good, uh, you have a dream, and then you wake fresh right before your, you know, before your alarm clock goes off, but you're ready to go. And you can see with adults, it's a little bit different. Um, older adults' patterns aren't quite the same. Um, I'm not sure why, but they're not. Okay, so just kind of notice there's a difference. But this is the typical... Uh, sleep that you should get. So if you're sleeping through your alarm, it means you're waking up in these deep sleeps. Ideally, you want to time it so you wake up right after a dream. What affects our sleep patterns? We have the suprachiasmatic nucleus. There's a good word for you. Okay, and melatonin is a big part of it. Some of you may take melatonin supplements to help you sleep. Um, 
probably should be cautious with that. There is no long-term testing on the effects of melatonin. However, it does seem to induce what we call normal sleep as opposed to many of the sleeping pills that people take, which actually don't. You know, the drug-induced sleep actually don't induce normal sleep patterns. You can see what happens is the light enters the eye, stimulates your pineal gland, okay, which then gets the melatonin production stops. It's suppressed. Okay, so this will make you awake and alert. You remember your pons is involved in that as well, right? In the base of your brain right here. Okay, and then when it starts to get darker, the stimulation causes, or the lack of stimulation of light causes melatonin to be produced, and then this is where your body starts to get drowsy, your body temperature drop, your heart rate slows, and then you drift off, you, you feel drowsy, and then it's, it's time for you to sleep. So why do we sleep? Okay, well, we find sleep protects. Sleep protects, you know, if you think our ancestors and stuff, it's probably a good idea at night in the dark, especially with nocturnal predators out there, to be, you know, safe in a cave around other people. It can help recuperation. It helps our, our, our brain recuperate somewhat in our body. It could be for memory storage. Perhaps is when we, we need to sleep to store our memories. We found when people uh, have a good sleep, they remember things better. Okay, they're also more creative with, after good rest. And sleep and growth goes together. The growth pituitary, pituitary gland will release growth hormone during our sleep. You notice down here the different animals, it's like the larger the animal, the less sleep they need. And it's mostly because of their metabolisms. For example, a bat's metabolism is quite fast, so they need more sleep. Okay, babies will sleep for about 16 hours a day, but as you get older, most people need about eight hours a day. Wouldn't it be neat to be a giraffe? You only have to sleep for two hours. Imagine all the work you could get done. You can watch lots more of these videos. You know, make sure you know all this stuff. And we're going to stop it there. And we'll look at psychoactive drugs in the next video. We'll see you guys in class. Goodbye for now.